when something largely disruptive comes around, when interest expenses are pressing quickly to the trillion dollar per annum mark, these are the times you say, wait, wait, we're not prepared. And there will be consequences of irrationally spending too much money when there are disruptions, when there are geopolitical events, when there are macroeconomic events, when God forbid the two co collide, you have to be ready as a country as opposed to in a weakened position. And we are right now in a very weakened position. Daniel DiMartino Booth, CEO and Chief Strategist of QI Research and a former advisor to the Dallas Fed, where I know you advised a former Dallas Fed President Richard Fisher for nearly a decade, um, and also author of the incredible book, Fed Up, an insider's take on why the Federal Reserve is bad for America. It is great to welcome you back on the show and great to see you again, Danielle. Thanks for joining me again. Likewise, I'm, I'm happy to be here. There's all kinds of rumblings coming out of the Dallas Reserve still a whole new plan. So we can talk about that. Still, we absolutely should. And let's kick things off where we usually like to start. I would love for you to share your macro outlook today. Take as much time as you would like to set the table, if you will. So um, so where we are today is, is, you know, I jokingly said to a colleague that we're back in the USSR a few days ago when, when the non-farm payroll data hit for September uh, there had been a lot of scrutiny uh, with uh, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics had been under a lot of scrutiny because there had been seven back to back downward revisions to the jobs data. And so I, I think taking one step further out on the USSR People's Bank of China spectrum, they said, you know, what? We'll, we're going to have some positive revisions for July and August. Now, there are going to be all government jobs. So the private sector actually saw negative revisions in July and August. And in fact, the government was responsible for a third of the jobs created in September. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm the last, I'm the furthest thing from a conspiracy theorist. But at this point, I think U.S. data is becoming embarrassing. We have more strikes going on. Mack Truck, 4,000 um, workers from Mack Truck uh, just joined the UAW strike. Uh, none of these data are showing up, whether you're talking about weekly jobless claims or the monthly figures. But I will say that it's going to be pretty hard to, 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 to hide what's going on. And again, this is my macro picture of an economy that is 70% consumption. So what's happening in the job market is always front and center for me, first and foremost. But I will say that in the current week that we're recording this, there is the survey date for the October non-farm payroll report, which is the 12th of every month. So whatever week the 12th falls in, that's what the government, that that's the government's official survey week. So it's going to be kind of difficult with yellow trucking severance beginning to end with thousands and thousands of workers on strike in the current survey week. It's going to be kind of difficult to continue fudging the numbers into October. And that's exactly what I think our government is doing. We have we have bankruptcies running at the highest level since 2010. Where are they in the data? Nowhere. We have prices for discretionary goods falling despite the UAW strike. You've got you've got auto manufacturers putting incentives out there that we haven't seen in years. Uh, you've got home builders buying down rates to try and push people into homes they can't afford. It's clear that the U.S. economy is in a recession if it wasn't for everything that that Uncle Sam is either spending or fudging. So yes, so we are all, so, okay, your outlook right now, we are already in a recession. It sounds like we're kind of papering over that with all of the spending or, um, you know, the, the numbers, if you will. Well, if you, if you look at gross domestic product, you know, the economic output of the country, nearly a half of that in the most recent quarter that was reported was attributable to government spending. And you know that government spending is by definition not efficient or productive or eventually profitable and something that's good for the private sector. In fact, government spending tends to deplete from private investment and it takes away from long-term growth. So never a big fan. Yeah. Can I ask another? Okay. So it makes me wonder, maybe this is my like uninformed question, but if that's the case, 
aren't we going to eventually just it it can't doesn't seem like it could be sustainable for the long term from like preventing the actual recession. Well, it's becoming more and more difficult to do so because, again, private companies are not buying into what Uncle Sam is selling. So they're not hiring. They're not going out on, out on hiring binges. In fact, we're seeing the opposite thereof. We're seeing continued layoffs. Uh, I always liked it to toot the horn of dailyjobcuts.com because they do such a, they do such hard work tracking from all the way from mom and pops that are closing on Main Street in America to the companies doing layoffs. They they look at every single aspect of hiring and firing in America. And it, it, they're having a hard time keeping up. For me to say we're running at eight to nine businesses a day that are closing may not sound like anything. But that's tremendous for an economy the size of the United States that's supposed to be dynamic and regenerative that's just not. We're going back in time to late 2019 to where the economy was then, slowing down then before the Federal Reserve and the fiscal authorities had the moment of the pandemic to inject more fiscal stimulus into the United States economy than what we saw uh, during World War II. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, speaking of the Fed, what's your outlook there? I take it. Um, well, I want to. I don't want to put any words. I want to hear your th- your thoughts there on the Fed um, and how you're kind of reading into um, what they're doing as it relates to this. So I, I think we are uh, in a higher for longer regime, and an entire generation of investors and um, and savers, whether they know it or not, an entire generation of savers as well has been trained under a lower for longer regime. Don't put your money in the bank because there's no compound interest in a zero rate environment. Buy junk bonds, go as far on the risk spectrum as is inappropriate for your age. We've we've gone 180. We've gone a full 180 degrees now. Now you get paid for saving, you get five and a half percent on your cash. You don't have to take excess risk if you're 85 years old and retired. That's no longer the rules of the game by the same token. You know, if you're Joe Q borrower, you're no longer in an environment where you can take risk for nothing. Uh, you know, your money is not free anymore. And that requires uh, much more uh, rigid due diligence in terms of making new investment. We're not seeing very much of that. And we're seeing companies really buckle under the strain at the same time of not being able to refinance. While 2023 has largely been a commercial real estate disaster kind of a story, we will be talking a year from now about corporate America struggling to roll over its debt because debt that was originally taken out at 2 3% simply cannot be refinanced at 8 9 10% and allow the company enough excess cash flow to remain a going concern. Hey, everyone. Uh, Thank you for listening and watching the show. I do want to share something with you all. And if you've been here since earlier this year, you've probably noticed that this channel and the content that we're putting out has improved. And I'm not talking about the interviews. I'm talking about the quality of the production. And I have one person to thank for that. And that is my wonderful producer, Matt Marlinsky, who is the founder of Marlinsky Media. So, If you're someone like myself and you want to get started in podcasting or maybe you already have a show and you want to level up the production, you have to work with Matt. Not only is he a super talented producer, he is a wonderful person and there's no one I would rather build the show with than him. And he's also great when it comes to producing content. So if you already have content, he can help you create more short form to grow your audience. So definitely go check out Marlinsky Media. Okay, back to the interview. There's a lot I want to dig into, and this is so great having you because I always learn something from you, um, and you're highlighting a lot of really important things. Um, I want to bring up this notion of like we're not seeing um, new investment, and also this idea of like you don't have to take that excess risk when I guess you could just buy like you know short dated um, treasury bills and and you're making a return right there, so you can just kind of sit on the sidelines, if you will. If you had to like flesh that out, what are some of the implications, um, maybe to the broader economy or I guess business in general? So, I mean, this is, this is an about phase for, 
for equity investors, mainly, uh, you know, you're getting so much more. Let, let, let's say uh, you're talking about um, a company that pays a, a 3% dividend plus the risk of owning the equity. Who would do that? And, and I don't mean to be overly simplistic, and it obviously depends on your age and where you are in your personal investing cycle. But given the backdrop right now and how crazy overvalued stocks remain, even after some of the setbacks that we've seen, given overvaluation, given that that, that junk bond yields really don't yet reflect what I would think to be the credit risk assigned to them, just the interest rate risk. Who's paying you to take on the risk uh, that a company's not going to make it? Nobody. You really aren't being compensated. And this presents, you know, there's been a lot written about this in the last week. This presents a real conundrum for the universe of registered investment advisors. They can't say in this environment, you have to take risk to make return. People are able to see with their own eyes. You know, my, my mortgage is 3%. I'm getting paid 5 5.5% on my cash. I'm just going to go sit on the sidelines and eat popcorn. I'll buy the beer and and wait and see what the outcome of this is because I can, you know, I can see, I can read that this is an artificially inflated supported economy care of my tax dollars spending inefficiently. So why would I take risk? Why wouldn't I wait and see what the end of the movie is before jumping back in when valuations are much more grounded? Yeah. Wow. Okay. So on the conundrum for RIAs, why would anyone like want to even like, sorry, this is my other naive question. Why would anyone even want to even pay like any sort of like management fees or anything if it's just like, gosh, I can just get 5% like again buying like short dated treasuries. Like why? Unless you've got, you know, a manager who is seriously in the trenches and they're, they're finding companies whose dividends are really, really high compared to the market and safe. So and, and and or they're looking for 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 companies with with bulletproof Teflon balance sheets that come what may they're going to survive. So you should you should buy their bonds because you know that they pay even more than treasuries and that the company is going to be fine through a recession. So take that extra income that you that that they're offering because they've got a great business model. But this takes us back a long long ways. We have an entire generation of registered investment advisors that have been told to go put forty percent in the Vanguard All Stock Fund, and then put a you know put a slice here in international stocks and a little bit of EM here, and put the rest in bonds. That's all they've been trained to do, and they show you an efficient frontier and what your long term returns are going to be based on this. And what they've never understood, they're saying is assuming we're in a zero interest rate Federal Reserve policy regime. Because if we're not, then you actually have to pick companies. And in a pure indexing world, that's not that's not a stock picker's world. And that's where we've returned to. And that means you're actually, you, you're going to have to have real talent working for you. Yeah, like a return to like real stock picking, like kind of like that Peter Lynch way of doing things and makes you wonder, like, is it a bit of a lost art? You know, uh, that's a good question. I mean, you know, we have uh, we have very active management for our municipal bond portfolio in my home, and you know, they're always looking for that that diamond in the rough for that state or municipality that has not gone off the wires and, and just you know just completely gone profligate and spent too much on public spending, whatever, and might offer that you know after tax return that's going to be a lot better because we're in no no state income tax Texas. So where can we find a little bit extra? I mean, we, we've always had somebody very active in that world, and you have to have been active in a world that hasn't been taken over by ETFs. But even with corporate bonds, you know, that that universe is north of a trillion dollars now. Even the corporate bond investing universe has been taken over, in, in a certain sense, by passive. And if there's one, well, two things that have never really been tested by higher for longer, that's the entire structure of passive investing plus private equity. And private equity is something else that's never been tested by higher for longer. And we're seeing quite a few public pensions say, you know what? I don't have to do this anymore. I don't have to lock my money up for 10 years. I can go get in a private credit fund and get 14% and have that be unlevered and then take the bulk of the rest of the cash 
for grandma and grandpa, retirees, pensioners relying on this and stick it in cash. So it's not just individual households that in terms of looking at how they design their portfolios and position themselves. It's not just it's not just individuals. It's also some of the biggest money managers in in, in the country. Yeah. Daniel, you know, um, I think you look at risk. And we've talked a lot, and I, and I sense there's some that you've already highlighted, but where for you does the biggest risk lie today? So I think the biggest risk is first and foremost in the main middle portion of commercial real estate that has yet to trade. It We once lived in a world where extend and pretend was measured in years. Now lenders are only doling out those grace periods in a matter of for a matter of months. Uh, they're all waiting for the Fed to capitulate and take interest rates back down to the zero bound. Um, but I think your next area of risk is going to be corporate debt. So unless you are in truly safe companies, I think that the one area of the one broad asset class, if you will, that does not reflect the underlying value through the prism of credit spreads, which is what most people look at, uh, that that is not reflecting what the real risk is, um, to say nothing of the stock market. But of course, credit precedes equities when it comes to credit usually leads a true downturn in equities. And we haven't really seen that. We've seen, again, we've seen quite the default rate cycle take off. Mm -hmm. It's real. Uh, but it's certainly nothing that, that you would consider to be Armageddon at this point. Yeah. Can we um, extrapolate that, though? If the risk is in corporate debt, what for you is kind of like that nightmare scenario, if you will? And like, how does that kind of play out into the broader economy? I imagine there are ripple effects when you start to see um, this unfold. Well, I think, um, you know, we, we've seen a few flashes these last few weeks. We've seen headlines that say, you know, the largest high yield exchange traded fund has seen near record outflows. Uh, so there's definitely nervousness out there. I, I think I think the next step out on the spectrum is for redemptions to potentially be sufficient enough to force the trading of the underlying bonds in these ETFs that don't trade. So right now there's that visually, at least, there's ample liquidity because there's 30, 50 names in these ETFs that easily trade back and forth. And that works until it doesn't, until redemptions are high enough that all of a sudden you're trading the e-liquid paper underneath those, those big, easily traded names. That's when I think things start to get a little iffy. And, and recognized as such. Yeah. Yeah. It makes you wonder, like, with all of the passive, all of the ETFs, like, have we kind of created like a bubble out there? We haven't seen what it looks like on the, the other way, on the way down, I see well. Well, we haven't, um, especially because so many U.S. Uh, working men and women are in what we call target date funds inside of their 401ks. And, you know, if, if the idea of target date itself is revisited, if if the idea that you don't necessarily need to be 60% stocks, 40% bonds, if if bonds all of a sudden, uh, and, and when I say bonds, I mean to say really safe bonds, if there's a rethink in terms of what the ratio should be between stocks and bonds, that's a watershed moment. And I think... I think we could see that. I think we could see a situation where bonds become so undervalued that there's a, a revisit to how a lot of these automated retirement funds should behave. Yeah. Let me ask you um, about the Fed, um, because I did hear you talk about um, the zero bound. Do you see a scenario... Do you think that's over? Do you think we ever get back to the zero bound? Or is that just like some sort of investor fantasy out there? Uh, well, it's my investor fantasy. So, and and I think it's Jay Powell's too. So, uh, you know, things are always unpredictable in an election year. And I dare say this might be 
a memorable election year we're stepping into in 2024. I mean, we are in October, right? So the, the clock is ticking. We've just got about 12 months left here. Um, so if Jay Powell survives uh, the the politics of what's to come, and I don't, I don't know that he will. But if Jay Powell survives, to answer your question, I, I think that the the Fed's so called dot plots that there are summary of economic projections that go out several years and never show you anything a Fed funds rate south of. 2% something. So you've got a two handle as far as their projections can go. And I, I know Jay Powell philosophically is not returning to the zero bound because he finds it to have been broken. I think he would say the same thing about using the Fed's balance sheet, that the Fed's balance sheet was used as a weapon of mass destruction and should not have been. So uh, I, I could also see quantitative easing, you know, if nothing really systemic breaks in the system. Systemic means, um, it's a fancy word for saying, if we don't see contagion, where where dominoes start to fall throughout the global financial system. This is what happened when Lehman Brothers fell. This is what happened in late 2018, when Japanese banks had overexposure to U.S. Uh, collateralized loan obligations, and it looked like there would be contagion after issuance froze up, which prompted the Powell pivot. It looked like there was this Lehman moment that was about to grip the global financial system. That's one thing you're never allowed to do, no matter how hawkish you are. If you're Paul Volcker and you come back from the dead, you are not allowed to allow the global financial system to implode. It's just it's really bad for your resume if you're a central banker. So systemic risk is a big no-no. Barring that, I think that Jay Powell could succeed in the time he has left in office in getting rid of the zero bound and in getting rid of quantitative easing QE, and I hope he I hope he succeeds because they're failed tools. Yeah, let me ask you one more question as we um, round this conversation out, and I just want to be really um, mindful. And I know things are early, but just this weekend and the events of this weekend and the attack in Israel. Is that a risk that investors are paying attention to or need to pay attention to? Or how are how are you thinking about that? Well, I'm thinking about it in, in the historical sense of, of course, Israel is one of the United States' closest allies. Um, this is the worst attack in decades and decades and decades. Uh, I, I think about the reduction in defense spending in recent generations and how that plays into the potential for, if not fighting, supporting a war on two fronts. Uh, because this is very real. This is not a tangential ally, if you were to suggest that Ukraine was, in the sense that we, we must protect against aggression, the aggression of Vladimir Putin. This is a very close ally you're talking about. And so geopolitics begin to matter when there's more than one major event occurring. And we haven't had this kind of a backdrop with anything this grave in some time, with women and children being kidnapped and things that bring up words like the Geneva Convention. Um, so this, I think, is something that investors should certainly not ignore um, because it will pull the country. And it will pull on the country's resources at a time when deficit spending is already at, at wartime levels, even though the United States is not technically at war. That's how much the current administration has overstepped its bounds to paint a facade of a strong economy rather than let the business cycle do what it's designed to do and cycle through. Yeah. Just another quick one on the deficit um, being at wartime levels and this notion or this kind of a facade of um, a robust or resilient economy, the implications of that too, of like not really getting our fiscal house in order during this time, I imagine there could be some longer term consequences to that. Well, there certainly could be at times like these, uh, 
you know, the United States as a safe haven is, is much more front and center. But that should not take away from the fact that not having our fiscal house in order when something largely disruptive comes around, when interest expenses are pressing quickly to the trillion dollar per annum mark, uh, these are the times you say, wait, wait, we're not prepared. And there will be consequences of irrationally spending too much money on some of these ESG, DEI initiatives that the private sector, for whatever reason, isn't touching. Oh, because it knows that they're not going to make money. So there will be consequences to be paid because when there are disruptions, when there are geopolitical events, when there are macroeconomic events, when God forbid the two collide, you have to be ready as a country as opposed to in a weakened position. And we are right now in a very weakened position with a divided political party like like you've never seen. There's intra-party fighting on both sides, by the way. This is certainly not unique to one or the other. So these are the times that you literally pray for strong leadership, that it come and it provide wise guidance. And we're certainly not there right now. Yeah. Well, Danielle, I have to say, I always enjoy interviewing you and learning from you and just listening to you. And this is such an important conversation and I'm so appreciative to you. I want to give you a few minutes um, before we wrap. Let folks know where they can you know, find you on social media, read your research and any parting thoughts um, that you might have for the folks who are watching and listening. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, I always enjoy speaking to you as well. It's a pleasure. Uh, Please come find me, dmartinoboothsubstack.com. We purposely uh, keep our research at very reasonable levels so that just like buying Fed up, you can always stay abreast of what's happening in the economy at a very reasonable uh, price. And if you don't already follow me on Twitter, they say it's a free MBA. That's my favorite catch line. So follow me at dmartinobooth, please. Even though sometimes I can be snarky, I'm told. Uh, and, and, you know, my parting thought is, is to always look at what's happening in the world, look at what's happening in the country and be as conservative and save as much as you can, because it's always your family and their future that you have to look after. So always look within and do as much of your own homework as you can so that you're not being guided by others, but others are simply helping guide your way. Those are some great parting thoughts. Daniel DiMartino Booth, CEO and Chief Strategist of QI Research. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time, your ideas, and all of your knowledge. Really appreciate you taking the time, Danielle. Thank you for having me today.